Well, welcome. Today, one of the most influential people on the lives of our children is visiting with us today. I mean, we always think about town government being influential, but this person literally dictates what our kids do six to eight hours a day. So good to get to know him. Why don't we start with the introduction? Sure, Kevin McIntyre. I'm the superintendent of the Milford Public Schools. Um, I'm starting my 11th year in the district, and we're we're very excited. Um, there's actually there's a lot of very exciting things happening in our schools right now. Now that's a unique case, isn't it? That you've been a superintendent for 11 years. I mean, I read that most superintendents last two or three. Yeah, it's similar to an NFL career. I think it's, you know, not for long is what the NFL stands for. And that's, that's true in the superintendency, too. And, you know, it's, I've been fortunate to be in Milford for as long as I have. Um, I love the community. I love the people. Um, it's, it's become home for me. Well, you think about it, I think the three years is the turnover of the school committee. <laughs> Correct. Correct, because the, the group that gets you on enthusiastically is gone. All of a sudden, the, the new group comes in with their ideas. And the relationship sometimes changes and sours a little bit. But even if it does, it's got to be a unique or great advantage to have a decade behind you and know Milford. Well, the, it's, it's great because, you know, I know, I know the folks in town hall. I know folks in the community. I'm able to, like, you know, if I, if I go in and get, like, coffee or a donut someplace, inevitably I'm engaged in a conversation with someone there, uh, which is really nice because it's, um, it's, it's, it, it speaks to the community that is Milford, too. I, I think it's a wonderfully supportive community. I think they put the children and the students first. Um, in ways that you don't see everywhere um, today. And I think that's, for me, that's awesome. Well, we've got a unique municipal to school relationship. I mean, people always say, you guys never disagree, and I start laughing. <laughs> you know, because every year we start out with the finance committee banging their chest saying, we're bankrupt, we're broke, we're desolate, and the school committee saying, we need a billion dollar increase. Right. And right. somewhere, over the next 60, 80 days, it comes together. It, it does. And I think, uh, you know, I think people, I think they misinterpret the positive relationships with, I think, the different groups doing their jobs and doing their due diligence. Because we have developed, I think, positive and good relationships over the years. And there's, and there's some trust. Well, I'll never forget, I think it was 2003, been a few years, when our budgets got cut. Mm -hmm. And towns around us were deferring their raises, the teachers' raises. And I never understood how that works, because I can't afford to pay you extra today. At the end of the year, how am I going to afford to pay double? Right. And right. I was stunned, because, you know, the rumor is that the teachers' union will eat their young and all this negative um, bias against the union, and they came back and said, we will defer our raise forever. We'll skip a raise if you keep the money in the school system to keep teachers. Mm -hmm. What more could you ask? And, and that's something that's actually very appealing about Milford overall is I don't know if we've ever laid off a teacher, um, at least not in the last 20 or 30 years. And it's funny, I was uh, talking to a candidate today, I meet every new teacher that comes in and have a conversation with them, get to know them a little bit. And the teacher had been um, a veteran a veteran educator, but they'd been one year at a new place um, and we're excited to start a new program. The community got into financial trouble and his position got cut. And luckily, you know, we had a position and we were more than happy to welcome the, you know, who had a fantastic experience to us. But one of the things I said is we've, we, we don't lay people off. We are very, very thoughtful in the budget process. Even though we're growing, we're doing it thoughtfully. Well, the thing that people forget is if you lay off a teacher, right. the benefits that go with it, basically you have to lay off 1.6 teachers and the minute you lay them off, you know the population grows. Right. How is that going? I mean, I, I was the one that always busted your chops and Bob <laughs> Trombley's about. Right. In 1974, we graduated 222 kids. Tw 
was it 20, no, 40 years later, we had 265. So we added one kid per year. Right. I shouldn't have jinxed us. <laughs> so we, we had a period um, for about five years where we saw exceptional growth. And we're, we're up somewhere between four and 500 students than the average. Typically, we were somewhere between 4,100 and 42 and maybe 25. And now we're, we're getting close to 4,600 students, um, you know, consistently. This year, and I'm not sure why, we were pretty stable. Uh, we, we, we added about, I think, five students from, you know, August 30th through June 30th. And we had some, a lot of comings and goings, but the net was about a handful of students. That's amazing. Yeah. So this is the first time we've really been stable in about six years. Because when you were adding 200 some a year, oh. I mean, I sit there and say that's half, that's a memorial school. Right, right. Um, and we were always playing catch up, and you know this this year finally, I think going into it, we're going to be um, our staffing levels are are pretty close to where they need to be, which is you know a good place for us to be because we we haven't been there for the last four or five years. We've you know we've added students mid year, and we've had to figure out creative solutions to you know the new students that we had. Well, the South American summer always works against you. <laughs> Correct. Correct. We see we see an influx after the, uh, the you know the Christmas holidays typically or after New Year's. Because all of a sudden, surprise, here's another 50 or 60 kids. Right. And, you know, whoever walks through the door, we're obligated to educate them. And we, we take that well, responsibility very seriously. At the end of the day, it's like when we talk about budgets and we growl publicly, <laughs> there's a core belief that if they bleed red, we, they're Milford kids, we take them. Absolutely. And we educate them. Absolutely. And town meeting's always been good. I mean, you scared the heck out of us two years ago. When you came in and said, we need six million incremental dollars. Right. <clears throat> that was um, a unique situation. But luckily, the uh, state came through with seven million. Correct. And last year, seven million. Yeah, we've been big beneficiaries of the Student Opportunity Act, which recognizes not only the growth in students, but the change in our student population. Well, the Student Opportunity Act, when you think about it, for how long we've been saying our demographics mm -hmm. cost us a lot more money correct. than surrounding towns. 100% correct. So when the Student Opportunity Act came through, I think it said they're targeting uh, high po towns with high population of SPED, mm -hmm. English language learners, yep. and economically disadvantaged. Economically disadvantaged. Yep. And I'm amazed that, is it 50% of our kids at the high school qualify for free lunch it's it's right around there i think district-wide we're over we're, we're slightly over 50 percent right now it's amazing because it's thirty four thousand dollars of income per family right that you can survive on that is yeah. amazing yeah the, gr the great thing right now is um every student in massachusetts has access to free breakfast and free lunch and that's going to continue at least until next year and i think um we're working with Carla Tuttle, our food services director, and a couple of folks on the school committee, that even if um, we go back to the old way of doing business, we may qualify as a district to have everybody continue with, with uh, access to free lunch and breakfast. Well, the one thing you can be safe in assuming is that if Carla's there, they're getting good food. Absolutely. You know, and Carla's never turned anybody away for a meal. But somehow the quality, oh. you know, when you listen to the Reagan era, where ketchup was considered a vegetable. <laughs> you know, I remember the look on Carla's face saying, not Milford. Right, right. You know, somehow she always comes through and the quality, it's Oliva's quality. And, they, and they've, they've, they've done a lot of great, like, adjustments and shifts to the menus based on our changing student population to try to accommodate student need. The other thing we've done for, this will be, I think, our eighth, eighth straight summer is we offer a summer lunch program at Memorial Elementary School and we get um, uh, we work with the YMCA and the Milford Area Humanitarian Council and there's a lot of like activities games special guests usually a patriot or two makes an appearance over the summer um, there's a lot going on there and they provide great lunches free for anybody who any student who comes in well I think people don't a lot of people don't understand that for some of these kids it's their only real meal Mm -hmm. So when the school shuts down for the summer, the kids still need to eat. Absolutely. 
So having that program continue through the summer? It's a nice bridge between, you know, the end of the school year and the beginning of the next school year. And, you know, I don't know of very many, if any, Milfordians would turn their back on hungry kids. And, and I will say the community's been great. We've given grocery bags to families on the weekends. And, you know, individual donors, local grocery stores, local food pantries have all stepped to the plate. And we always have... Um, you know, pr fresh produce, canned goods, pasta, um, to send home with kids and families consistently throughout the school year. And somehow the town meeting always seems to come through for our kids. You know, this one, the one coming up is going to be the biggest challenge. Correct. The aircraft carrier of the fleet has to be redone. Yes. So what's the word on Milford High School? So we've submitted our third um, statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. The, the first year we weren't um, among the districts that they were considering. Last year they, I think, did their due diligence on us because they saw us as a community that is, you know, the, the building has needs. Um, it's got an aging infrastructure. And um, unfortunately, there were other communities that had buildings with greater needs than us. I'm hoping that either this coming year, as you stated, or the year after, we're able to be accepted into the program and kind of move forward with what will likely be a renovation, a significant renovation. I can't imagine building new. I think we'd lose, well, one, is I think the only place we could do it is probably somewhere on the high school grounds, similar to what we did in Woodland. Is there enough room with all that wetland? I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, and that's not something that I'm an expert in by any stretch of the imagination. But I think with a renovation, we don't lose square footage. That worries me the most because Milford High is a bunker. Mm -hmm. You know, the walls, the, they're going to be there yep. long, long after you and I leave. Correct. So renovating it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But... It was built at a time when the square footage per student wasn't an issue. It was much more generous than it is today. It was today. a lot more generous Correct. until Newton North came in and spent $250 million and, on their school. And that changed the game for everybody. And now, unfortunately, $200 million is maybe an elementary school these days and not a huge Taj Mahal High School. Yeah, you start thinking about the pool. Mm -hmm. the SBA has said they won't pay for pools. Correct. So we'd have to pay dollar for dollar. And I think the thing that worries me the most <clears throat> is that we are one of the few towns that are holding steady or growing. Mm -hmm. But they won't let you build for anticipated growth. Correct. So when they divide the, well, how many kids in Milford High now? 1,300? It's about 1,300, yeah. When they divide the square footage by 1,300, they say you're way over the limit. Right. Shrink it. Right. Well, I don't know that many people in Milford High would agree that we can shrink it without hurting programs. Well, I just received an email from principal, high school principal Josh Allen this morning trying to figure out some additional space in the building just based on just the needs of the students that we have. Yeah, I was surprised he let you stay. Because <laughs> <laughs> when we had middle school least up for discussion, right. My bet was that Josh was going to have a revolt and take over the whole central office and move you all out so he could have more room for the kids. Well, I still think that's maybe part of the long-term planning. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a needed project. Um, you know, our, our roof, our plumbing, our electrical, our um, you know, heating systems are all in need of upgrade, replacement, repair. And I think like the building, when it was built, I think it was a fantastic building in the 70s, but the educational realities today are very different than they were in the 1970s. Well, we're coming up on our 50th reunion. Correct. Next year, class of 74 will be hitting 50 years, Yeah. which means the building is 50 years old. Correct. Which is, you know, about the life of, uh, of, a, know, building. of a school. Yeah. 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 So we're, so we're getting there. Now, we do have two exciting projects happening as we speak right now. One is um, the uh, turf in the track is being um, replaced and upgraded and renovated. And uh, Brookside uh, Elementary School, we're adding uh, six additional modular classrooms. That's 
and again, we say modular is the way they're built, but they're permanent. But they're permanent. They're permanent they're, classrooms. It's a permanent addition <clears throat> to the building. Because I know a lot of the residents were worried that they think modular. If they're old like me, they remember the trailers <laughs> at Memorial and at Woodland. Correct. And this, this is very much an additional wing to the building. And it gets integrated into the rest of the kind of the building in, in, in the grounds. And they do an outstanding job. I had the opportunity to visit uh, a few of the school districts who, who actually worked with this company. And the central office was happy. The community was happy. And I got a chance to talk to a few of the teachers who were kind of in those classrooms. And they said they actually loved the classrooms because the um, in the buildings that I were in, they had more climate control in the new wing than they did mm -hmm. in the in the previously built building. But now, will this give you a chance to shuffle some of the kids between the two elementary schools? Yeah, so what we've done the last few years is new kindergartners who were in the walk zone between Memorial and Brookside all went to Brookside. Because what, we, what, what happened was Memorial's student population was getting larger than Brookside, but Brookside was a bigger school. Bigger school. And so we had to shift it. And I think by just making that adjustment, We've, uh, we've been able to kind of reverse that trend and it's kind of worked out nicely. Well, it's amazing because you go through these phases. When Memorial first came online, we were amazed. Mm -hmm. Those kids had lockers. Right, right. They had a cafeteria. Right. They had a gymnasium. It was considered the Taj Mahal of Milford. You know, we went to Spruce Street. I started getting a stigma, um, worried that when I moved back to Milford, Every school I went in was gone. <laughs> West Street School became a parking lot. Right. Oliver Street School became an apartment building. Spruce was the library, and Stacy was boarded up. Right. I was like, okay, I jinxed every school. <laughs> but, you know, now Memorial, I don't know what would be next. Would it be Stacy or Memorial? Probably Stacy then Memorial. Um... Just based on the, the years of, like, I think the Stacy building is close to 100 years old. Um, it's been renovated pretty significantly, I want to say in 97 or 93, um, whereas I think Memorial was earlier than that in terms of its, its building. And, I mean, there's been a lot of upgrades and upkeep to the building, but it's, it's probably number three on the list of priorities right now. Well, when you think through it, Milford's got five major schools. Mm-hmm. School's average life is 40 to 50 years. So every 10 years, you're doing something. Correct. You know, because I remember when we put money away after Brookside in the stabilization account, people said, well, we just built a school. Why are you doing that? I said, there's a school coming. Right. And when Woodland came, we put more money away in stabilization. They were like, well, we built Woodland. I said, there's a school coming. Correct. There will always be a school coming. Yeah, and I think that I think that's a great way to look at it is that ten year cycle. Because you just you you really need like either a significant renovation or like in the case of Woodland a new building every time. Yeah, well years. I mean you bring up the high school and you sit there and say it's ideal location. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the only dirt I know of that we own that's big enough for a high school is Asylum Street. And I shake my head thinking what traffic would be like for the people in the universities. Right, right. And God bless the kids, but they are teenagers. Correct. It, it definitely changes the makeup of a neighborhood if you throw a high school in there. Oh, yeah. And even that major highway, Route 140, right. sending all the buses from what, I mean, if you were down the Medway line, you'd have to start the day before. Correct. And our, and our best days right now... Um, our, our roads are more congested than they were five or six years ago. Yeah. And we've actually had to shift school times, start times, because we've had you know, so many buses arriving late because of additional traffic and the, the growing student population. Well, the town meeting, again, everybody's complaining about this will be $100 million of Milford money, because it probably will be. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine we'll get away with a renovation under 175. Yeah, it'll probably, and, and again, it's all sp Speculation Speculative. and conjecture, but yeah, I, I think you know if we get you know reimbursement rates somewhere between fifty and seventy percent. Um, if we do that, I'm buying lunch. <laughs> right. Because I'm looking at Woodland at forty-eight percent if we were lucky. But you know, either way, when you start at one hundred seventy-five million, yeah, it's going to be seventy-five to one hundred million. You're, of, you're talking double the cost of what you know, double the yes. impact of what Woodland was. 
But we, town meeting agreed to put away the uh, feasibility study because you brought up the fact that we have to be ready to move. Correct. If the SBA says, can you move? We have to say yes. We have to say yes, and it's a lot and then safer. We're the, then we're on the clock. Yeah, you know, it's a lot safer to say, yeah, we can because we already have the money put away in a um, special account. Correct. You know, so that, that makes me feel better. Hopefully, we can address things like a field house. That would be awesome. I think that would be something that could be, I think the high school already is a center of the community, but I think adding a field house would, you know, I think there'd be a potential to really turn well, that into a real community center. If we built a new wing, then you could move A wing into there and then B wing into A, you could shuffle it. Absolutely. But, you know, you start thinking about the kids who are athletes, our student athletes, as Pete calls them. Mm -hmm. I go to Shrewsbury. I go to different towns, and wow, they have field houses that really show well. Yeah, and we have a huge track and field program that would be great to practice. Well, I mean, I went to Shrewsbury. An, there's wrestling. There's yeah. everything everywhere. Yeah. And nothing against Pete, because God bless him, he's got his heart in the right place, but... Hamburger Helper only takes you so far. Correct. Correct. You know, it would be nice to give him a field house that he can have all the athletes in the winter participating. Plus, it would be nice to expand some of the facility footprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it ends up being something that, like, you know, the, the, the turf and the, tra and the track, it, it gets used from the time the sun goes up to the time the sun goes down. You know, well, we have, you know, five in the morning, we have folks walking the track or jogging the track. We have, you know, organized teams, kids getting out there and kicking a soccer ball around or throwing a lacrosse ball around. Well, that was one thing that the school committee committed. Um, not that they had to, but we said, is this going to be a fiefdom where you put up the moat, you put up the walls in the moat and only high school and uh, middle school kids can use it. And they committed to let the whole community use it. And it seems like they've lived to their commitment. Yeah, and it's, and it's worked out pretty well. We kind of have a, a level of priority. You know, the, obviously the high school teams have first access and then, um, you know, town teams and then, um, you know, community teams and then it's open to the public. Well, having the turf there, I think, makes a world of difference. Absolutely. Because, you, like I said, you're getting two and a half fields. And if it rains, you can still you use still, the you field. Can still play, yeah. Player practice. So now we shift over to academics. How are we doing? We're doing well. You know, we had a great class um, that just graduated. You know, a lot of top schools. We had students going to places like Tufts, Duke, Holy Cross, which I know is near and dear to your heart, um, UMass Amherst, um, a lot of selective colleges and universities. Um, we had a number of students that are going on, and I'm sure uh, our athletic director, Pete Boucher, talked about this. We have a very high percentage of our athletes that end up you know, playing at the next level um, and, you know, going and, and going to colleges to pretty incredible places. We had three places. times the percentage getting scholarships for sports than the national average. And, and that's pretty consistent year over year. It's amazing. Well, Pete impressed me. He's now been here 10 years when he mm -hmm. came on the show 10 years ago. And he described his charges as student athletes. And I said, this guy's got his head on straight. Because less than one half of one percent of the students ever make a living at athletics. Absolutely, you're generally. I think the ad used to be they're going pro in something else. Yes, but now all of a sudden, you get the right attitude. They understand that they're representing their town, not just the school, but they're representing Milford when they go out, and they do well, and and they get scholarships. Absolutely. You know, when you start, I mean, we were talking. Schools like Northeastern, BCBU, Holy Cross, 80 grand a year. Mm -hmm. Gulp. That's a lot of money for a working class town to f afford. It's, I think, a lot of money for anybody. Yeah. Well, especially when you figure families like yours that have more than one kid. Absolutely. I'm going to have three in, in a year. So you're going to be cutting steaks at Shaw's for... I, I'm going to be doing something on the weekends. I might be, uh, del you might see me delivering uh, your food through Uber Eats or something. That just amazes me. But 
I love the attitude that our AD has. I love the results. And it just helps the town justify, because they want to help the students. But it helps town meeting members justify supporting the students. Well, the education, you know, if you look at just, let's look at Milford High School, for example. The access to um, just a vast array of courses, from advanced placement to early college to project lead the way to things like business and banking, um, it's just incredible. And I would put what we offer at our high school up against just about any, I, I would put up it against anybody, because I think what we're offering um, provides pathways for student success. So how do you answer the question when people say, will my child get a good education if they come to Milford? I would say absolutely, and I, and I would say that without question. Um, you know, a, a, any student can go anywhere from the Milford Public Schools, and we've seen, you know, students who, um, you know, go to, you know, the NESCAC, Ivy League, places like, you know, Duke, Georgetown, you know, your top, top-level schools. But we also prepare students who maybe college isn't the path that they want to take. We have a construction trades, a building trades program that, sets them up for a job in, you know, construction, building, highway department type work. Um, and, and that's been very, very, very popular. Now, I want to go through that because for years I've been questioning why. When I grew up in Milford High, if you were going to college, you went to Milford High. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be a tradesman, you went to BVT. But... My understanding is for the last decade or so, and I love what Dr. Fitz has done. His results are great. Students do fantastic. But I've always been concerned about people like my father. Mm -hmm. Put my father, who had four years of school in Portugal, in an organic chemistry class, uh, results would not be <laughs> stellar. Put a tool in that man's hand, he was an artist. Mm -hmm. But he would never get into BVT because he wouldn't be the top 15% of the academic class. But I was told we couldn't compete with BVT programs, so we couldn't have programs for people like my father. What's changed? So what we're really trying to do is we're not creating there's, – there's programs that run through um, BVT and other technical high schools are called Chapter 74. And we're not necessarily creating Chapter 74 programs, but what we're creating is a couple courses that are kind of pathways that will lead to – um, like, like building trades is a great example. There's a building trades one and a building trades two, and we have partnerships with employers out in the field, you know, large construction companies, builders, who are, who are really dying for, you know, skilled workers or semi-skilled workers. And they'll take somebody with some skills and, you know, kind of do the rest because they, they really want folks who are excited about, you know, the construction trades, um, and have a little bit of skill or knowledge, they can really work with them. And it leads to a pretty, um, you know, a pretty lucrative career, or can lead to a pretty lucrative career. Well, you would think because I needed a plumber and I was quoted three weeks. Correct. So it tells you right there that there's a need for those trades. 100%. And I think if you're a little bit savvy as a plumber or an electrician, um, you know, we don't necessarily have those programs, but we're trying to connect kids to programs at some of our community colleges that lead to, like, careers in medicine, where you could become, like, a radiology tech. And those folks make pretty good money. You know, well, right the bio school. operators, I mean, when you think about it, when we built our plant for uh, antibody production up in Worcester, we were hiring people, and the starting salary was in the 50s. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad starting salary. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when you factor in that you don't need to come out of a hundred some thousand dollar debt for college, that becomes a viable avenue to pursue. Yeah, and we're, we're you know, I think to that point, we're trying to make connections with advanced manufacturing companies who are really trying to. Um, connect with high schools because they can take a student with a certain set of skills and, um, you know, that can lead to, I think, you know, a pretty solid middle class kind of lifestyle. You know, and it's funny because back in 74, when Paul Revere and I were there, <laughs> um, three of us ran out of chemistry classes and science classes 
and Paul Raftery, who to me is the model for a principal who cared, banished us for two days to go to uh, Dean Junior College mm -hmm. and take a bio class and a chemistry. I don't know how he got us to get there for free, mm -hmm. but it was, no, it was three days a week we went to Dean Junior College to take courses. I mean, now I understand Josh has got a library of advanced placement courses. We do, and we've, we've had great relationships with Framingham State University, Mass Bay Community College, LaSalle University, and we've really um, been able to, like, we've had some students that have exhausted the math courses at the high school that we offer in person on the ground, and they've been able to connect for, with, you know, higher level calculus or um, algebra or, or, you know, more theoretical mathematics courses that have prepared them for, you know, their next step in, you know, in the STEM courses they're going to take in college. Well, that's fantastic because when I first got to Holy Cross, freshman year, took my calculus course, I realized how far behind I was because this was a review for 80% of the kids mm -hmm. who had already had one or a year and a half of calculus, and this was brand new to me. So the fact that, one, we have advanced placement courses that you can take online mm -hmm. is amazing to me because realistically it puts our kids on the same level playing field as kids coming from private schools. Yeah, and again, I think you know what we offer at Milford High School and through the Milford Public Schools in general, I think competes with, with anything, I think anything in the world. And on top of that, we're um, supporting you know a community, a student community where 50% of our families speak a language other than English is the primary language in the home, and so there's you know a lot of program and support to uh, you know get our students, um, our multilingual learners, up to speed in um, English so they can kind of you know work on grade level in English because most of our courses are taught in English. Well, it's amazing because. Kids pick stuff up so quick. I remember when I first left my house on Water Street, I came home and said, Mom, these people speak funny. Because I had never spoken anything but Portuguese. Right. So the idea of speaking English was foreign to me. And yet, you learned it. You picked it up, and off you went. Well, we, we have a student right now who came to us in middle school not speaking a word of English and is currently starting his sophomore year at Brown University and made the dean's list during his freshman year. And, you know, it's just one of many success stories. Well, that was my cousin, Jose Violant, who showed up when he was 14 or 13, something like that, never spoke English. And within years, a short number, moved up the ranks, mm -hmm. and sure enough, got a scholarship at Brown, mm -hmm. excelled at Brown, became vice president of Johnson & Johnson. So Milford did well by him. And, and yeah, we have a lot of those stories. You know, and again, I know that you have a jaundiced view and the school committee has a jaundiced view, but to me, the real judges are the colleges. If our kids were getting into Okie Finoki Community College and that was it, I'd turn around and say, I'm not impressed with what you're doing. But when I see how many kids go to Ivy League schools and baby Ivies or get a choice like UMass. Mm -hmm. UMass was not looked highly upon when I graduated Milford High. Now... It's a destination. <clears throat> it's a reach school. You know. it's, um, and, and, and the programs, and I, and I have to say, and I've seen this, not only UMass Amherst, but UMass Lowell has really um, significantly increased its profile, you know, in, in terms of an engineering school, um, the STEM programs there. Um, you know, I think the state schools, and we send, we send a lot of our students to state schools in not only in Massachusetts, but Rhode Island, New Hampshire, all through New England, um, but they're great options. And they're, you know, a little more affordable and a little more um, economically viable than a some of the private more, schools. A little more, 40 grand a year is more than a little. <laughs> <laughs> I remember getting a letter from the president of Holy Cross, and I happened to have been having dinner with him, and I said, you know, 
I thought you were well-educated, but now I'm questioning your English skills. And he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, Father, using the word only, because he went through all the cost savings, and only, and back then it was 65000 in a year. Right. Those words shouldn't be in the same sentence, because there's no only about sixty five grand a year. And, and really now, most of the private schools, colleges, and universities are somewhere between you know, 70 and 80,000 a yeah. year when you throw in, you know, room board, books, um, which, is, which is crazy. So how do you answer the question, why are Milford schools, MCAS scores, much lower than the surrounding community? And, and, I, and I think that goes to um, a lot of our students, we have a lot of students coming to us at different points in their educational career. And it takes them, as we just talked about, you know, your cousin, I think you mentioned, was, was a great example where, you know, the, the MCAS is done in English. And if someone speaks Portuguese, they really struggle to answer questions in English. And it can take three to five to six years for, it's usually four or five years for a student to get really proficient in English. Um, and during that time, they're still taking the MCAS, but they're taking it in a language that's foreign to them. And, you know, there's, there's a few years of real struggle. Well, the one person who really put it in perspective for me was Tommy Davern. Mm -hmm. now, there was a man who really loved the kids at Middle School East. Absolutely. I mean, that was his world, and he took personal pride in making sure that nobody messed with his world. And when my daughter joined the eighth grade there, I went in, I, I knew I was going to get a reaction. I said, Tommy, why do your MCAS scores suck? <laughs> He looked at me without blinking and says, because you're ignorant. Yeah. I said, great, enlighten me. And he says, you're not considering that we have a bimodal distribution. I'll put our top kids up against any town around us, mm -hmm. and we won't come up short. And that's still true today. And he says, but, and then he put in perspective. If I came and said, Kevin, you're going to take a test in two years in Mandarin. You're probably not going to do real well because you're barely learning the language. Correct. But should parents be concerned that when you mix English language learners with native English speakers that the teachers have to teach down? No, and I, and I think if you look at, like, I think if you just look at college admissions, you know, I think our students that are, you know, going to the, you know, are competitive at the most selective colleges and universities are going to do that regardless of the population in the classroom. And that's why we have supports for students as they learn English. And, you know, sometimes just pull out where we bring them um, into another classroom and provide intensive English instruction and support. Some of the services are push in. Um, and sometimes there's a variety of, you know, pull in and push out or push in and pull out, I should say. Um, but I would say the short answer is no, they shouldn't worry about it. Long answer is there's a lot of support and we try to meet the needs and I think we do so successfully for a variety of students. Well, the cynics come back and say, okay, <clears throat> so you're getting the kids into these top schools. Mm -hmm. How are they doing? They're generally doing very well. I mean, I remember my ungrateful offspring number one, <laughs> her second semester, Junior year. It's, I'm gonna, it's funny that you say that because my kids, I have four, four kids, and they always ask me, who's my favorite? And I say it's a four-way tie for last place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember she got, it was the first time she got a low grade, a low cum. She got a 395. <laughs> she got a B-plus that year. And I kept teasing her, saying, you know, did we do a little too much partying that we got a B-plus instead of all A's like every other year? And she, she showed me how smart she was because after I ragged her enough, she went and had my transcript pulled. <laughs> and she held it up and said, hey, Dad, I don't see 4.0s across the board here. But all kidding aside, it showed that she was prepared mm -hmm. mentally and academically to take on a top school and succeed. Yeah, and, and, our, and our students are very well prepared. The, the concerning thing for me is that as our poverty numbers rise in, in, in town, and they have been rising over the past, I'd say, seven years, um, what you see in college is um, a correlation between kind of poverty and, and lack of college attainment and completion and wealth and a higher level of college attainment and, and, um, 
and completion. And so we're putting programs in place like One Goal, which is a program that supports first generation college students. We have the early college program that gives students access to not only courses, but also the college campuses so they can get a feel for what it's like and what the expectations are. And then we have, you know, a, a couple of great mentoring um, programs that a number of folks in the community have participated in where they support students through things like filling out the FAFSA form, completing college applications, advising students about, hey, you know, these are some courses you want to take so you'll be successful. And I think it's providing those additional supports. I think now, we're going to see what's the difference rate. between... I'm involved in the Connections program, mm -hmm. which is mentoring first-generation kids going to college. Mm -hmm. What is the One Goal program? I, One Goal is very similar. I think we have so many um, first-generation college students that um, we're, we're running multiple programs to support them. And I think both groups are taking advantage of things like early college and you know accessing courses to make sure that they have a leg up and a few credits under their belt um, before they get to school. But I think the programs are very similar. One, one key difference between One Goal and, um, and the Connections program is the One Goal program actually also follows the students while they're in college. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a staff member who, I know it's at least for the first year, I think it might be for the first two years, actually works with students after they graduate and provides support, as well as the One Goal team provides some support. Well, you to hear students. back from your student. Cause a absolutely, especially when in the Connections program. You know, it's like I was amazed when we started because there was a financial issue. I mean, this was a normal family. Mm -hmm. So coming up with 40 for a state program or 80 for private was not a trivial matter. Correct. And getting kids, I mean, I got to admit, when I graduated Milford High, the first thing I thought of was getting away from Milford. <laughs> you know, I've been here my whole life. I want to get away and explore. I didn't go far. I went to Worcester. But well, that's, pretty, that's pretty exotic for a Milford kid, though. <laughs> there you go. It just, we started out with the same thing that my daughters did, not my youngest. My youngest said, I'm going to Holy Cross. That's the only place I'm applying to. <laughs> but my oldest started with the University of Pluto, College of Mars. Right. How far can I get away from Milford? Right. And the best advice I got was, leave her alone because mm -hmm. the concentric circles got tighter and tighter and tighter and she went to Worcester mm -hmm. you know so I had a student who I was really proud of the fact he applied to six schools got into six schools and got financial aid package that only cost him a couple thousand a year to go See, that's, to a that's, UMass program that's fantastic so you know you got somebody coming out of Milford who is not going to be crippled with debt. Because he, he looked at Penn State, he looked at U Minnesota, and that was going to cost him, you know, 20 to 30 grand a year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how these kids come out of school with $100,000 worth of debt and start their lives. Well, I, I think of like the first house I bought was a house in Pennsylvania. And I think it was like one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, which at the time seemed like an astronomical amount of money, and it was. Um, but that's like what some kids are carrying coming out of undergrad. And as a, as a, that's as a in addition payment. to having to get a, a house. Correct. Having to get a car. Correct. Because I remember when I first started, my first house was in Annandale, Virginia. My mortgage was two hundred forty-nine dollars a month, <laughs> and I thought that was a lot of money. Yeah. And that's barely like a car. That's a that's a that's not even a lease anymore on a car. So now, as the kids come into Milford High, the environment itself. One of the questions that always comes up is, we read in the papers all the time about the danger in schools. Is Milford school are Milford schools safe? One hundred percent safe. I, I have to tell you, uh, my office is right in Milford High School. We're kind of right off the, the main kind of hallway. And I spend a lot of my time walking around the hallway talking to students. And I never feel anxious. I never feel worried. Um, is, there, is there an issue or an incident? Um, absolutely. And that's going to be true of any time you bring 1,300, 14 to 18-year-olds together. 
Um, but it, overall, the, the buildings are very, very safe. We have, we have a great relationship with our police department. We have two school resource officers that are on, you know, on campus between the schools all the time. Um, you know, the, the police response team is always, you know, moments away. Um, you know, great relationship with the fire department. They always respond very quickly when there's an issue. Um, and we have, you know, a very, you know, a lot of supports throughout the building and throughout all of our buildings that um, contribute to kind of a, you know, a sense of community and a feeling of safety. Well, I remember how close the fire department was to the kids mm -hmm. because we needed a picture for a yearbook. And they said, well, you can go up to the top of the high school. And I looked and I said, no, I'm too old for that. <laughs> So I called down to the firehouse and said, is there any way that a ladder truck would be driving by Milford High? And without blinking, Teddy DePaulo, Scott Marshall, they said, well, we'll make it happen. And they brought a ladder truck, which was an experience climbing up that ladder, to be able to look down and get the whole class. Mm -hmm. But there was not, well, why are you bothering us? Or It was like, sure. And, and they've been great. I mean, you know, when I go down and visit the preschool, which is also located in the high school, you know, the, uh, the fire department's there constantly, whether it's a touch a truck event, or they're teaching the kids about fire safety, or um, they're talking about careers. Um, there's a really nice, nice relationship with our, with our other And um, with the police, departments. when, I mean, I remember at the FinCom, I think it was Robbie Ticino came up and explained that we're part of a regional SWAT team. Mm -hmm. And they can have somebody, a group of SWAT officers for an incident at the high school within 35 minutes. And we asked a dumb question like, well, does the challenge, la well, the average incident is over an 18. Right. So I'm like, so wait a minute. You're telling me that the SWAT team showing up 20 minutes, almost 20 minutes after it's all over? And they said, yes, that's why we want to have our own SWAT team in Milford. And that was a big decision because it's 600000 a year mm -hmm. to support officers in every school and the equipment and the training. Was that a good investment? 100%. And we've seen, we've had a few issues over the years where there's been, you know, the need for a quick response, and there always is a quick response. We also, you know, whenever there's, like, something that's happening on social media, whether it's, you know, a bomb threat, or you've heard of the swatting incidents. The police um, have been great in terms of providing, you know, resources or officers on site just to kind of ease the community's like anxiety more than anything else. Well, one of the things that you read about is that the officers aren't familiar with the buildings in a lot of these school shootings. And ours are. They do trainings in our buildings every time there's a vacation. You know, so. You, they're there, number one. I think there's three out of the five buildings have an officer in it as they rotate. Mm -hmm. And they know the buildings. They know the kids. They know the principals. They know the teachers. So nobody is surprised by, you know, you know it's, it's really nice when, you know, we do have, like, we had an issue this year where a student sprayed mace in a hallway. And it was a big response um, by, you know, not only the local police, but, a, you know, a regional team. And I have to say, like, the work that everybody did together, because everybody had those relationships in place, was fantastic. And we were able to kind of assess the students, make sure everybody was okay, assess the situation. And um, it was, you know, it was not a great incident by any stretch of the imagination, but it, was, but it was a great example of how everybody came together. But I heard people saying, I think they overreacted. And I said, I hope so. There's no such thing. <laughs> I hope so. You know, if there's anything to deal with the safety of our kids, I hope they always overreact and, uh, and move on this side of caution. And, you know, and it took a little longer because we assessed the health. We wanted to make sure anybody who was potentially exposed, we didn't want to send anybody home on a bus if they were going to have some kind of medical issue. And, um, you know, we got everybody the medical attention that they needed. But we also didn't send problems home to parents either. Right. Um, but, it, but it's just an example of how everybody worked together. Everybody knew each other. We could communicate quickly. There's no egos. It's just like, what do we need to do? How do we get it done? 
So now, besides having too much money and not enough things to spend it on, <laughs> what is the biggest challenge you think you're going to face in the next year? I, I think um, you know space is really the biggest issue we have, and and, and the unknown around the student population. Um, that's but that's that's been our that's been our biggest challenge the last few years, and I think that's going to continue to be the case as we, um, you know, I think the classrooms at Brookside are definitely going to help. Hopefully the MSBA comes through either this year or next year, and that creates some additional space. Because the other thing we're going to do in that project is we're going to bring the eighth grade over to the high school, and that's going to open up space all the way down through. How does that work to have seniors with eighth graders? They wouldn't really. I think the eighth graders would have a wing to themselves. Oh, okay. And so they would have their own lunch. They would, you know, I think well, the one advantage is that some of our students that are a little advanced could maybe take some of the advanced high school mm. courses while they're there. But generally, like our eighth graders would just be on campus and um, almost have an experience, you know, in, in their own wing into themselves. Well, I remember the, the trauma of going across Spruce Street. <laughs> you know, when you were in sixth grade at Spruce Street, everybody was the same. And then you were walking across the street over the wall to Stacy, where they had seventh and eighth graders. Right, right. And then it got scary when you walked the 20 yards, because back then it was two buildings. Mm -hmm. From eighth grade Stacy, now you were walking into, well, it's now the Paul Raftery wing, to the high school. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at least that was two steps. Yeah. I, I, could, I, I, I see it as a separate wing, and I see the programs pretty self-contained. But again, I think it gives some of our students the opportunity to... I think engage in higher level courses and also potentially engage with students at the preschool too, you know, because like, I think that's something that our high school students have done and that's worked out really well. And I think if our eighth graders could potentially do that too, I think that's another part. Well, that was always experience. a concern that the preschoolers were with old kids. Yeah. But that hasn't been an issue. No, not, not, not at all. And, you know, again, there's separate buses for the preschoolers. So they're, they're, they're very separate. They're in the kind of the, the back side of the building. And we have one, one high school class down there, but it's an early childhood class. And so the class is in there, and they also interact with you know, some, of the, some of the preschool students in classrooms. So how do you deal with space? I mean, you're adding it's, a classroom. Well, not this year, thank God. But the last few years, you're adding a classroom per school. We've creatively used a lot of existing space. Um, we've any space that we could turn into a classroom the last five years we've done that and I think you know I give you know our administrators our maintenance team a lot of credit for um, you know just coming up with creative ways to add classrooms like Stacy we've we had to cut the library media center in half and we put two classrooms in there yeah. you know it's just one example um, this summer we broke a larger classroom up in the high school and broke it into two classrooms that can fit a full classroom full of students in them each. And, you know, unfortunately we're running out of those spaces. And so if we have another big, you know, rush of students, it'll become, you know, very, very challenging to, you know, kind of figure out where we're And And at, at the high school too, like, you know, if I'm, in a, if I'm a classroom teacher, my room is used every single block. And it's just about every classroom that, like, if I have my, you know, planning period, I have to go somewhere else because there's a class You in can't there. plan in your own room because it's active. Correct, because we're maximizing the space. And what we had to do with the middle school is the middle school is on three different bells at one point. We put it all in the same bell so we can use every space every period. And that's another thing that's opened up space for us that, you know, it, it, people are like, why are you doing this? Well, because we need space and we can't use a classroom for 30 minutes and have another class coming in with 15 minutes to spare because the, you know, at one point the bells were, um, you know, they weren't on the same bell schedule. Each grade was. Well, here's a loaded question: schedule. Do you have the staff? If you have the space, do you have right, the staff? Right now we have the staff. Right now we have the staff. I think if we saw, you know, another huge influx of students, um, we we'd, we'd have challenges again. But I think we're finally staffed up. We're not chasing. We're not chasing students this year, which I think is a good thing. Well, this is the first time in a couple, two, three years that that's happening. Yeah, I'd say six. So if you wanted to leave a message with the community, what would that message be? I, I would say the Milford Public Schools are here for you. We're here to support your students. We're open to families in the community. And 
we want to we want to have each student have the best possible experience they can have, and that's really our goal. Is we really want every student to have an exceptional experience. And if your student is struggling academically, socially, or there's some other issue, talk to your teacher, talk to your building principal, talk to me, because we want to make sure that we can we can correct it and provide additional support. So you're saying that as an average parent. They can call Josh Otland, they can call you and say, Absolutely. I need help for my child. Absolutely. Now, if somebody calls me about a second grade classroom issue, I'm probably going to call the principal and say, hey, Mr. Korea just called and he has a concern about X, Y, or Z. Can you give him a call back? And that's generally what I would do initially. But that's at least an avenue to pursue. Absolutely. I think I remember when we were trying to... Um, we had my daughter in a private school for preschool. And Jose Vieira was the one who convinced us, because I went to him and I said, will my daughter get a good education here? He said, absolutely. I said, what do I have to do? He said, be involved. Mm -hmm. He says, if you want to assure that your child gets the best education she can, then be involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have, you know, for our... Families that don't speak English in the home, if they speak Portuguese, Spanish, or one of the 38 other languages. I was going to say, it's no longer just Portuguese and no, Spanish. No, no. There's, there's, I think we're over 40 languages now in the schools. Um, but we have translators in the Family Resource Center that's available all the time. Plus we have, I think it's up to about 140 staff members who speak multiple languages. Um, so we have a lot of resources to make sure that you're communicating with somebody in the language you're most comfortable. Well, that's so critical because my father and mother, my father especially didn't speak much English when I was in school. He would show up at every school event, had no idea what was going on, but he was told, you have to support your son, be there. Put my father his, spoke English and I'd say the same thing. <laughs> he put on his hat, put on his coat, mm -hmm. and would go in the audience. Now, I knew, he knew that what was being said was just blowing over his head. But it meant so much to me when I looked out in the audience and saw my mother and father there. But And being there is so important. That's a, that was it. They were there for me. Mm -hmm. And it kind of instilled in me that, well, I owe them. If they're putting that much effort into being there, I got to hold up my end. So, well, thank you. And thank you for everything you do for our kids. It's always a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's, it's my pleasure to serve the Milford community. Well, hopefully for many years. And as always, to our six loyal viewers, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better day than, than today. And parents, if you have any questions, take Kevin Dr. McCarth up on his offer. Give him a call if you need help. Give Josh Otlin a call if you need help or any of the building principals, and they will help your kids. So as always, thank you for joining, and thank you for everything you do.